We continue a very exciting portion of text tonight, looking at one of the Apostle Paul's sermons and seeing the multiple references that he makes to the prophetic scriptures, demonstrating the importance not only of Old Testament prophecy, but also demonstrating to us that it ties directly into our presentations concerning Jesus Christ, the sharing of the gospel, if you will. The Old Testament scriptures portray Christ. He is seen throughout the Old Testament. And yet how few of us know anything about the Old Testament. We know passages in the New Testament and we use those certainly for sharing the gospel of salvation with people who are lost. But the Apostle Paul focuses, and we'll see that I think in great detail tonight, focuses very directly on many Old Testament prophetic scriptures when witnessing particularly to Jews. So if you wish to reach Jews for Christ, then it's important to know the Old Testament scriptures, for that they do consider to be authoritative. Tonight, the message is entitled, Forgiveness of Sins versus the Law of Moses. That text comes to us from Acts chapter 13, verses 38 through 41. But to put it in context, because it is also a prophetic passage, I'd like to just summarize what we did over the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, we saw how God-haters fulfilled Bible prophecy when we looked at a few of the prophetic references to the death of Christ and the actions and events surrounding his death. That included what the Jewish leaders would do and say, what the Romans would do and say, and what Judas would do and say, all prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. Those prophecies included how the Jewish people would respond, first at the triumphal entry, and then as the Passion Week unfolded, until the crucifixion and burial of Jesus. The prophecies concerning the death of Jesus Christ included the specific words of Christ, which he would utter on the cross, and specific words that the God-haters would utter in response. The prophecies included the exact amount of money that would be paid for Judas to betray Jesus. We saw that as we put those in their context, the doctrines of predestination, election, and reprobation, clearly illustrated by those incredible prophecies. Then last week we looked at the resurrection of Christ and Old Testament prophecies, to which Paul makes reference in his sermon here in Acts 13. And that, of course, doesn't cover the many, many references and times that Christ prophesied his own death and resurrection during his earthly ministry as recorded in the Gospels. What we saw was that everything in the Christian faith rises or falls on the resurrection. We saw that in this sermon of the Apostle Paul, he spends the most time on the resurrection, eight verses in total, focusing on the resurrection. We need to remember that, people, when we witness. A lot of times we do spend a good deal of time, and rightly so, on the death of Christ, dying for our sins, but without the resurrection of Christ, the death of Christ is meaningless. There is no proof that his offer of salvation is true unless he is risen from the dead. The resurrection is the heart of the gospel concerning eternal salvation. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 15. We saw that in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Without the resurrection, there is no gospel and there is no hope. The resurrection of Christ is the guarantee of our resurrection never to die again. The resurrection of Christ is the guarantee of the rapture, and we saw that in 1 Corinthians 15. That's how the Apostle Paul closes that fantastic resurrection chapter in verses 15, uh, 51 through 57. Because of the resurrection, we will also rise, and because of that, the promises concerning the rapture are true. The resurrection of Christ is the ultimate motivator for encouragement and holy Christian living. He makes that very clear in the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, therefore, that's based on the resurrection and all these things that are as a result of the resurrection. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And of course, you can see why when Paul preached the resurrection, since most people think when you're dead, you're dead, and that you will find in society around you today, he got an electrifying, positive response to his message. He gives them good tidings. The promise was made unto our fathers. God has fulfilled the same unto us 
their children in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as also is written in the second psalm. And we began to see that there were multiple passages in the Old Testament which specifically refer to the resurrection of Christ. That first prophecy out of Psalm chapter 2 relates to that phrase, This day have I begotten thee. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's a millennial psalm. Most of the context of Psalm 2 is Christ coming back to earth, defeating the kings of the earth at the Battle of Armageddon, and establishing his millennial rule. But in the middle of that, we find this reference to the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there will be no Battle of Armageddon. Without the resurrection, there will be no defeat of the kings of the earth. Without the resurrection, there will be no millennial rule of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the point that Paul makes here in this sermon, quoting Psalm 2. We also saw that uh, the resurrection proves that Jesus is not an angel, quoting Psalm 2 in Hebrews 1.5. Quoting Psalm 2, it's with the resurrection that Christ began his high priestly ministry on our behalf. We find that quote out of Psalm 2 in Hebrews 5.5. 5, and there would be no ministry of Christ interceding on our behalf if the resurrection were not true. We saw that this psalm, Psalm 2, is the proof that Christ is the eternal creator, the one who is the firstborn from the dead, in Colossians 1, 17 and 18. It's the proof that Christ is the qualified judge to be the judge of all men in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, where it says that from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, which will be where we're moving tonight as we talk about the forgiveness of sins. So the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is central to many of the doctrines of the Christian faith. Without the resurrection, they cannot take place. The other psalm we saw that Paul quoted was Psalm 16. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Psalm 16, 10. And we spent some time looking at that too, how our Lord Jesus Christ though he bore our sins, was not sinful himself, and therefore his body did not see corruption. It did not rot. Marvelous, wonderful truths related to that, and one of the proofs also that he was indeed sinless. And the last passage that we looked at was Isaiah 55, verse 3, because Paul quotes Isaiah 55, 3, to prove that the covenant with David was a guarantee of the resurrection of Christ. That is the only way that David could have had an eternal heir to sit upon his throne. Verse 34 of Acts 13, And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of, uh, of David. Isaiah 55, 3 is where he's quoting, Incline your ear and come unto me, here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. He's talking about the everlasting covenant made to David. The Davidic covenant we looked at was in 2 Samuel chapter 7 last week, where God promises David that he is going to have someone who comes forth from his loins, one who will be his physical descendant, who will sit on his throne forever. In fact, we saw that forever is used multiple times in that covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse uh, 12 and following. Thy days shall be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And God said, I will make his kingdom established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Verse 16. Verse 25. And concerning his house, establish it forever, and do as thou hast said. And you look through this covenant and you say, well, the Messiah has got to be one who will rule forever. That fulfillment of the sure mercies of David. So, truly, the resurrection of Christ is the key to the eternal reign of Christ as well. We're all aware of the prophecies of Christ that foretell his death. Just two chapters earlier, Isaiah 53. So, within the immediate context of those incredible passages about the suffering servant, where Jesus is prophesied to be crucified and killed. 
But if the literal death of Christ was prophesied and literally fulfilled, how then could the Davidic covenant be fulfilled? God had promised that the crucified Messiah would be an eternal heir that would sit on David's throne forever. And so I hope you understood what I was driving at last week out of that Isaiah 55 passage, because the only way that the Davidic covenant could literally and permanently be fulfilled was if the slain Messiah was raised from the dead never to die again. Yes, the resurrection of Christ is an important prophecy. And it's a, a very key to many other prophecies in the Old Testament. But you know those passages that we looked at, some of them seem to be obscure to us. And I wonder how many more prophetic keys to Scripture we have missed just because we don't know the prophets. And that's what brings us to the message for tonight. Forgiveness of sins versus the law of Moses. Down in verses 38 through 41. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now listen carefully to verse 40. Because he's going to make reference back again to the prophets. Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Here we have it again. Paul referring to the Old Testament prophets. His entire argument through his entire sermon hinges on the voices of the prophets. His argument for the predestined history of Israel hinged on the prophets. His argument for the conquest of the seven nations in the promised land hinged on the prophets. His argument for the beginning of the monarchy refers to Samuel the prophet. His argument for the eternality of the Davidic covenant hinged on the prophets. His argument for the coming of John the Baptist hinged on the prophets. His argument for the death of Messiah and all the events leading up to and surrounding that death hinged on the prophets. His proof for the literal resurrection of Christ hinged on the prophets. At every one of these junctures in his entire sermon, he refers to and quotes the Old Testament prophets. I wonder how many of us could do that. And then again, here we have verses 40 and 41. He continues to rely on the prophets. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Now, which of the prophets is Paul quoting here? It may surprise you. The Apostle Paul very clearly knew his Old Testament well. I suspect he had the entire thing memorized. There are Jews today who have memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. How many of us have memorized the entire New Testament? Certainly not in Greek, but even in English. How much of it have we memorized? How can you meditate on it throughout the day if you only have one or two verses that you learned in summer Bible school 50 years ago? Do you still memorize scripture? I hope so. I try to. Oh, it puts us to shame, dear friends. Why was Paul able to quote the prophets and pick out phrases from the middle of gigantic prophecies that applied specifically to the events that he saw in Christ? He's quoting Habakkuk. Habakkuk 1.5 with an allusion to Isaiah 29 verse 14. Here's what Habakkuk 1.5 says. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Direct quotation out of the last half of Habakkuk 1.5. The allusion is also to Isaiah 29.14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. 
for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Does the last half of that verse sound familiar to you out of the sermon I preached this morning and the sermon preached last Sunday morning? That's quoted by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, the great New Testament book dealing with the doctrine of the resurrection. That's a very important passage as well because we saw it in the context of the predestinating purposes of God and why he chooses the elect. We looked at how Paul quoted that 1 Corinthians passage when we looked at the choices that God made concerning Moses this morning, both last week and this week. So looking back now at Habakkuk for just a moment, when we study the context here in Habakkuk chapter 1, we discover that Habakkuk the prophet is trying to understand how God can use the pagan Gentile Chaldeans as an instrument of judgment against the Jewish people. Habakkuk reminds God that the Jews have sinned and thus we're going to come under the judgment of God, but the Chaldeans were so much worse than the Jews. How can God use this horrible, much wickeder, much more sinful nation of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, to use them as a judgment of the Jewish people who are not anywhere near as bad as the Chaldeans. That's the argument that Habakkuk is making in Habakkuk chapter 1. That's the context for our verse here. Listen to Habakkuk's please. I'm going, please, I'm going to start reading in verse 6 here. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation... This is the verse immediately following the verse that Paul has just quoted. That bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are also swifter than leopards and are far more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far and they shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come for all violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind. They shall gather the captivity as the sand. They shall scoff at the kings. And the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold. For they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend, imputing his power unto his God. Ah, there is the key. Yes, they're worse. But when push comes to shove, when someone gives his glory to his God rather than the true God, that's the point at which God judges. We saw that was the case with Isaiah and Hezekiah cooped up in the city of Jerusalem by Sennacherib, king of Assyria. When Rav Shaka cursed the God of Israel and talked about all the wonderful gods of all the nations that they had conquered because of Nisroch, their God. And as a result, the angel of the Lord killed 186,000 of them that night. They heard a rumor in their country. They returned. And Sennacherib was killed by his own two sons, Hedram, Malik, and Sherezer, as he was worshiping in front of this great and powerful God whom he thought was giving him victory and protecting him. Here is the mistake that they made, imputing this his power unto his God. Habakkuk hasn't yet put it together because he asked the question now in verses 12 and 13. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Verse 13. God, how can you put up with those people? Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? God tells Habakkuk, as we move from this point into chapter 2, wait and see. 
I'm using them as a tool for judgment, but their judgment is coming. Now, let's go back to our text for just a moment. We'll see why it's out of the context in Habakkuk 1.5. That verse that's quoted is immediately followed by that text that I just read to you. The text tonight, notice especially the phrase, For I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told unto you. And immediately following it says, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. But Paul pulls that phrase out to quote out of verse 5. Now, some of you may be of a detective mindset, I hope so, when you're looking at scriptures, you're eager to follow the clues, to find out what is going on here. Maybe some of you read mystery novels or whatever. Sometimes just reading history is a, an incredible mystery to follow what is going on. I'm currently reading a book concerning uh, Queen Elizabeth I, uh, daughter of Henry VIII by Anne Boleyn. I'm reading this book to my wife, and we are learning incredible amounts of history. And it is almost like a mystery, the intrigue and things that are going on. And we see the development and the fight that is going on between Roman Catholicism and, and Protestantism in England at that period of time, and Bloody Queen Mary and all the things that are, that are happening. Well, folks, the Bible is more exciting than that. There's a lot more mystery and, and intrigue and how do you put these things together? That's what the apostles were doing there in the upper room after the resurrection and the ascension into heaven. They were sitting around and studying the scripture, trying to put it all together and understand what it was that God was telling them. And that's why Peter is able to preach in his sermon when they're about to appoint Matthias about the prophecies concerning Judas. Peter was an unlearned fisherman. He'd sat under the teaching of Christ for three years, but nothing ever seemed to get plugged in. But now he's serious about it. Dear people, I wish we could get serious about studying the prophets. Studying the prophecies of the Old Testament especially, because they prophesy things to come. Back to the text. I'm sorry. I get carried away sometimes. But anyway, if your detective mind says I should bring you uh, to mind some other verses out of Habakkuk that are very frequently quoted in the New Testament, the very next chapter. Let me read three verses for you, see if you pick up on any of them. Picking up on them in the context of Acts 13, which is what we're talking about tonight. Remember, Paul is quoting Old Testament prophets in a Jewish synagogue where they would have known the prophets and where things should have started to click with them. Should click with us too. Habakkuk chapter 2, I'll begin in verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. I'm glad that God told Habakkuk to write it down. That's why you and I have it tonight. That's why what we're about to hear gets quoted multiple times in the New Testament. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So here's a prophecy that God is going to guarantee. Here's something that's coming. It's guaranteed to happen. In the end it will speak. It will come at the appointed time. Verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. That's the proud man. Look at the last phrase of verse 4. But the just shall live by his faith. You recognize that, don't you? Verse 4 is, of course, the cry of the Protestant Reformation. The just shall live by faith. We're not going to look at all the places that it's found in the New Testament, but, but three of the most important places where that is taught are Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 is quoted in a very specific way in the New Testament. A specific way that would relate to the Jews who had placed themselves under the law. The just shall live by faith. 
But the prophecy is that a day was coming when there would be a stupendous, incredible work that God would do that they would refuse to believe. I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. You beginning to see how the things fit together? How this prophecy from a verse in chapter 1 of Habakkuk fits together with what Habakkuk is told in chapter 2 about the answer to his question. Paul has just told them of the incredible work that is prophesied here. That work is the literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Christ, and now he throws down the challenge. Are they also among those prophesied who would hear and refuse to believe? Remember what that prophecy said. I will do something, I will work among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. He's just told them about the resurrection. That's the preceding verse. He ties it to that preceding verse of the resurrection. Are they going to be those who hear and who refuse to believe a work that was done in their day? Remember also that there are Gentile God-fearers in the audience. And as we looked at that Isaiah passage, it talked about the Gentiles. The Habakkuk passage talked about the Gentiles, the heathen. The Jews would have known those prophecies, even if the Gentile god did not know them. But the text in Habakkuk specifically mentions the Gentiles as well. Now I think we see the answer to that question in the following verses, where almost the entire city comes together to the very next week, the next Sabbath meetings, and the Jews, out of jealousy, then oppose and blaspheme what Paul is preaching. But in between there, it tells us that some of the Jews and Gentile proselytes did believe. Now, we'll talk about that more when we get to those verses, but I just want you to notice the fact that's what's going to happen next. There's a prophecy that some of them are going to hear it and not believe. Some of them will. The first issue, though, that we want to talk about or look at is the fact that Paul viewed what he was doing as a fulfillment of of that specific prophecy in Habakkuk 1.5. He was the one declaring it to them and how they would respond. Behold, ye among the heathen in regard and wonder marvelously for our work, a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Who was telling them? Paul himself was prophesied in the Old Testament. And he's quoting that verse, demonstrating that he's the messenger that's bringing it to them. Some exciting things when you begin to put them together in Scripture, the little detective work going on here. But now the key issue before us tonight is the relation of the law of Moses to forgiveness. Because after he says those two things, we find, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, that is, the resurrected Christ, through him is the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. It's amazing today how many people in churches, in apparently Bible-believing churches, focus on the law. Now we're going to see the purpose of the law tonight, the Lord willing. It is specifically told us the purpose of the law in the New Testament. Why did God give the law? But Paul makes it very clear here and multiple other places that the law was not given for our justification. When someone is telling you that you must keep the law either to be saved or to be sanctified, they are teaching false doctrine. When someone who is an antinomian says that the law has no purpose, and since we're free from the law, we can do as we please, let us sin that grace may abound, they are also teaching false doctrine. Those are the two extremes that relate to the law. 
either taking it for salvation or sanctification or saying it has absolutely no purpose anymore for us today and therefore we throw it out entirely and we can do whatever we want to do because grace covers it all. Paul fights both of those heresies and in the case of salvation, apostasy in the book of Galatians. And we'll look at some passages out of Galatians in a few moments. But that is the balance that we need to see tonight. In the context, what we discover is that Paul's claim is that the resurrection of Christ is the proof that Christ has the power to forgive sins. Remember, we're talking here in verse 38, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. So the first thing that we learn about the resurrection in the context is that this is the proof that Christ has the power to forgive sins. Never forget that in your witnessing to the lost. Now you're going to run into people who mock the resurrection. That happened to Paul on various occasions, such as his sermon on Mars Hill in Athens. However, those who understand the connection between the resurrection and the forgiveness of sins, something will click inside them, and they'll trust Christ alone for forgiveness. They won't trust Christ plus something else. The resurrection is key to understanding that it's Christ plus nothing else. His death paid the penalty for sins. His resurrection is the proof necessary to show that his promise of forgiveness is also true. Secondly, Paul squarely makes the argument that justification is by faith alone, and he makes it here in this context. It shows you that he's not only thinking about Habakkuk chapter 1, but he's also thinking about Habakkuk 2.4. Did you catch that as we read what was going on in Acts? Did you catch how he tied Habakkuk 1 to Habakkuk 2? Let me read it to you. Remember, Habakkuk's the book that declares the just shall live by faith. So now here's Paul's statement of justification by faith in Acts 13.39, our immediate context. And by him all that believe are justified from all things. Believe is faith. Justified is justification. Justification is not the act of God that makes us righteous. That's the doctrine of imputation. But justification is the declaration by God that we are righteous. The just shall live by faith. That is set by Paul in direct contrast to the law of Moses. Now it is certain that the law of Moses never imputed righteousness to any man. And from our text tonight and elsewhere in the New Testament, it's even more certain that the law of Moses never declared any man to be righteous. You are never made righteous by the law and you are never declared righteous by the law. Paul is preaching in a synagogue where the law of Moses reigned supreme. He has just tracked the history of Israel to show that nobody has ever been made or declared righteous by the law. He has just shown that there prophetically must be a different mechanism for being made righteous and declared righteous by God. He has just quoted Habakkuk to prove his point and he has cited the resurrection of Christ to confirm his point. Now I may be making it too simple and I may be making it too hard, but I hope you get what Paul is doing quoting Habakkuk 1 and alluding to Habakkuk 2. He is putting them on the spot where they must decide about Christ. Will they believe the prophets, not merely believe Paul's story? Remember, that's, that's important when you're witnessing. Don't just tell them your testimony. Give them the scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing you to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is the word that he is quoting. New Testament hasn't been written yet, so what does he use? He uses the Old Testament and with power points to Christ. The Jews in the synagogue had to make a point or make a choice. Would they believe the voice of the prophets concerning justification? Or would they continue to try to work their way into heaven by 
keeping the law. So what is the purpose of the law? Well, the law proves that we're all under condemnation. The law proves that no man can ever keep the perfect righteousness of God because the law is holy. And Paul makes it very clear that the hearers of the law are not just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified, Romans 2.13. And then he goes on to say that no flesh is justified in his sight. You can't keep the law. Your conscience will always condemn you. That's what Romans 2 is about. The law points out that we are sinners. It doesn't justify us. It tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Romans 3, 21 and following. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. I don't know how much more plain you can get than that. He's talking in a synagogue. He's talking to Jews. He's telling them their justification must be by faith in Christ alone and that you can never get forgiveness by the law of Moses. How many people try to get forgiveness by doing good works? They think that their good works will outweigh their bad works. Do you know what that is? Stated another way, that is, they are trying to be forgiven for their bad works by the good works that they do. That's the attempt to use the law for forgiveness. And the purpose of the law is not for forgiveness. The purpose of the law is for condemnation, to point out where we are sinners. It is a reflection of the holy righteousness of God. And you cannot attain that on your own. You can't. There has to be a different mechanism if you would become righteous in the sight of God. And that's what Paul is telling them here in this passage. Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Huh, interesting. This is Romans 3. We're still in Romans 3. It's witnessed by the law. And what else is it witnessed by? The prophets. The Apostle Paul spends a great deal of time in the prophets. How much of the prophets do we know? Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. That is no difference between the Gentiles and no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. Because, verse 23, the verse that we know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace. What's Paul talking about? He's been talking about justification by faith. The just shall live by faith. He quoted the back of 2.4. He's on the same theme here in Romans chapter 3. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that's a turning aside of the wrath of God, that's what propitiation means, through faith in His blood. Justification, grace faith, righteousness. To declare, that is what justification is all about, his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. What had Paul just been talking to them about there in Acts? The forgiveness of sins which cannot be accomplished by the law of Moses. Do you understand how there is a common core, common theme that runs through all of Paul's epistles and runs through every one of his sermons in the book of Acts. You cannot be justified by the law. By grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. That's the law. Lest any man should boast. That's the book of Ephesians. Oh, people, how many of us get caught up in the law-keeping business where we think we're making points with God because we have, in the flesh, kept the law? When you walk by faith, it automatically keeps the law, if you will. When you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the power of the flesh, you do those things that are pleasing to God. You avoid those things that are displeasing to God. 
And it's not a matter of checking off the 613 different prohibitions that the Jews have as a hedge around the law to make sure that you haven't actually broken the law. Your motivation is not law. Your motivation is love for Christ. Oh, that we might learn to practice it, not merely hold it theologically in our heads. Yes, Paul goes on here. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Whereas boasting then, it is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And suddenly we're back to the synagogue. <laughs> where Paul is preaching both to Jew Jews and to those who are God-fearers, Gentiles who have come into the synagogue. Listen to the next verse. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Paul is preaching to his audience, but it is an audience that includes all of us. The just shall live by faith. Romans chapter 7 uses the illustration of marriage, which we see in the first few verses of the chapter. And then he says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter. There's a difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. The legalist is one who tries to make sure he has stayed within the letter of the law while violating the spirit of the law. It reminds you of the Pharisees who, as they were condemning Christ, we're staying within the letter of the law and missing the whole point. When they pay Judas the money and then Judas comes back and throws it at their feet and they say, well, it's blood money. We really can't put it back into the treasury. <laughs> They're staying within the letter of the law. But they miss the point. How often do we try to stay within the letter of the law while missing the spirit of the law? And that's what Paul says here, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What should we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. See, what the law does, it reflects the holiness of God. It shows us what is righteous and what is filthy dirty. What it does is it condemns us when we walk in that which is filthy dirty. Paul says, you know, it would never occurred to me that covetousness was bad except the law said it was, and that made me a sinner. That put me under guilt. That put me under condemnation because I had covetousness in my heart. The law said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, that's evil desires. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. It takes only one violation of the law to condemn you. One violation to kill you. Paul says, it came, I understood it, and I was a dead man. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So there's nothing wrong with the law. It has a purpose. And Paul says so in the next verse. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just, and good. 
Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, that it might be seen for what it really is. That's why God gave the law, so you could understand what sin is. Working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. It shows you the bright, stellar clarity of the pure, holy whiteness of God's glory compared with your smudge that you think is white until it's compared with the holiness of God. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It's precisely what Paul has been saying in his sermon in Acts chapter 13 as he has been preaching to the Jews in the synagogue. Galatians chapter 3, one chapter later. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Remember, he's talking about the heathen back there in Habakkuk. And God working a work which people would not believe though it was declared unto them. And now we find the heathen are mentioned again here. God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You have a big, huge, strong chain. You break one link, and you have broken the chain. You've not just broken one link. You've broken the chain. You have to continue in all the things of the law if you would be justified by the law, and no man can do that. You break one, you've broken the chain. You break one link in the chain that chains the lion up against the wall and keeps him from you. You break one link, and the lion is free. It doesn't matter which link you break, he's free to kill you. That's the law. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For, and here's one of those quotations of Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. That's Galatians 3.12. You get it? The law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. What do we have? The cross. We have Jesus bearing our sins. And then when he's raised from the dead, we have justification through faith in him. It's a powerful, powerful point Paul is making Perhaps we don't have everything that he said in the synagogue that day, but we've gotten all the main points, and they are the main points that Paul makes in every one of his epistles concerning justification, concerning faith, concerning the law. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Remember, there were God-fearers in the synagogue that day. And through Abraham, all nations of the earth were going to be blessed. That the promise, the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We jump down more verses. We come to verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came on. Ah, now we're about to learn one of the purposes of the law. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. If you know anything about the ancient schoolmasters at the time of Paul, the ancient world, they were slaves who beat and beat hard the kids who didn't learn their lessons. It showed them where they were wrong. The schoolmaster was always pointing out their mistakes. 
putting red X's on their paper, if you will. What was the purpose of the schoolmaster? Paul says, that schoolmaster of the law was to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And after faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The law was a schoolmaster. For ye are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Jumping down two chapters, chapter 5, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Which would you rather live under? Law or grace? If you try to live under both of them, you know what happens? You fall from grace. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 and following. The law has a purpose. The law is good. But it must be put in its proper context. Paul tells that to Timothy. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, and this is very important. Dear people, I get all kinds of emails from all kinds of Christian organizations. Many of them are creationist organizations. Those are the ones I really enjoy reading. But I get emails from a lot of the reformed organizations, too. And within the last six or eight months, a number of books have been coming out that are telling us that the law is the standard of life for the Christian. In other words, they're telling us the law was made for us to live by. That is in direct contradiction to what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 9. Listen to it. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Is the law the standard for the Christian life? Have we been made righteous by faith in Christ? Does it contradict what Paul has been saying, that the law is designed for the condemnation of sin? Is that to be our focus, the Ten Commandments, so that we'll be good little boys and girls? What was the purpose of the law? Paul says it here in this passage. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. In other words, this is not a complete list, just like the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, which precede the fruit of the Spirit, are also not a complete list. Paul says, I don't have time to list everything, but you get the general idea. It's not made for the righteous man. It's made for the wicked man. It's made not to make us righteous or declare us righteous. It's made to condemn us. It's made to show us the holiness of God. It's made to show us that we cannot justify ourselves in the sight of God. It is holy and it's just and good, but it must be used lawfully. We know that the law is good if, if a man use it lawfully. It condemns that which is evil. It gives us a mirror that we can show to the unsaved sinner that he is lost. And when you hold it up to him and say, have you broken any of these Ten Commandments? He'll have to admit, yeah, he has. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Use the law correctly. Don't use it as your standard for life. Christ is our standard for life. And the Holy Spirit empowers us 
to become more and more Christ-like day by day as we walk by faith and as we walk in the power of the Spirit of God. Anything that is contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust, the salvation is by grace through faith. There are many more passages. Our time is up. We're four minutes past time. Lord willing, next week we'll pick up with 2 Corinthians chapter 3 because he talks about the difference between the glory of the law which is passing away and the glory that comes through the Spirit of God. But we'll have to close with that. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the time we've had tonight to look into your word. And the message that the Apostle Paul proclaimed and his knowledge of the Old Testament prophets so that as he tied it all together, he quoted out of Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, and then he referred to and alluded to chapter 2, verse 4. All that believe are justified, which you could not be done by the law of Moses. Thank you, Father, for your grace. We do not deserve it. The law condemns us. And yet in your mercy and in your grace, you have made a mechanism that is different from the law, for Christ has fulfilled the law, and he's been made a curse for us. And now as we trust in him, our sins have been judged because they were on Jesus. And by trusting in him, we who could not be justified by the law are saved by your grace. Help us to remember that when we witness Help us to remember how the resurrection is key to this, and without the resurrection, there is no salvation, there is no forgiveness, there is no justification. There is no future, there is no resurrection for us, there is no rapture, there is no millennial kingdom. All these passages tied together by the prophets. Help us to study and know the prophets, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And in harmony with what we have just